Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to lecture five of Cricket South Africa's level one umpiring course presented by Western Province Cricket Umpires Association. My name is Tom Mokorosi. I will be taking you through laws 26, 27, 28 this evening, and then I'll be followed by my co-presenter, Abdullah Stienkamp, who will take us through laws 29, 30, and 31. Just a reminder of the meeting protocols, Please all mute your microphones. Thank you. Questions will be taken at the end of the presentation where you will be allowed to unmute your microphone and ask any questions. During the presentation, if there are any queries on any slides, please put your questions into the chat box so that you don't forget your question. Also, please note the slide number that you are asking the question on. Right, so let us move on to the laws to be covered this evening. Law 26, practice on the field. Are players allowed to practice on the field before, during, and after a day's play? Let's see what the law says. The law defines a few different areas, and we shall look through whether or not players are allowed to play or practice on the few different areas. Is practice on the pitch allowed? or the rest of the square. The law says that there shall be no practice on the pitch at any time on any day of any match. There shall also not be any practice on the rest of the square at any time on any day of the match, except with the approval of the umpires. What you do often find on especially international matches and provincial matches is that the ground staff will have prepared practice pitches which are towards the edge of the square and each team usually has one practice pitch on which they can bowl on uh, before the match and also if they wish uh, during the lunch interval or the T interval. Are we allowed to practice on the outfield? I'm sure you've all seen most practice before a match takes place on the outfield. What are the restrictions for this practice? The law says that on any day of the match, all forms of practice are permitted on the outfield. When are practices allowed on the outfield, before the start of play, after the close of play, and during the lunch and tea intervals, or even between innings. The provision here is that umpires need to be satisfied that such practice will not cause significant deterioration in the condition of the outfield. Between the call of time Sorry, between the call of play and the call of time, so this is during play, practice shall be permitted on the field with the following conditions. Only the fielders, as defined in the team sheet, may participate in such practice. No ball other than the match ball can be used for this practice. I had a match a few years ago in Otsuaren, 
it was a three day match between uh, Southwestern districts against the Gauteng Lions, a provincial first class game. And the opening bowler for Southwestern districts, um, he bowled his first over from um, the north end of the field and then while the second opening bowler was bowling the second over of the day uh, the first opening bowler who was now fielding at fine leg decided he still needed to warm up a little bit more and was bowling practice balls outside just outside of the boundary to uh, his fielding coach and uh, initially myself and my partner did not spot this however the Gauteng side was sitting on a balcony just above where this player was now practicing his bowling and we heard a raucous uh, from the Gauteng players who were obviously complaining about uh, the Southwestern District opening bowler practicing on the side of the field with practice balls and his fielding coach. Uh, so we had to intervene and we had to tell him that this was not allowed. Practice is only allowed with the match ball and is only uh, and cannot waste time. Uh, that is the next provision that uh, we will have a look at. Uh, no bowling practice takes place in the area between the square and the boundary in a direction parallel to the match pitch. I will explain that uh, a little bit further. And as mentioned, the umpires need to be satisfied that the practice will not contravene either of these two laws 41.3 changing the condition of the ball or 41.9 uh, time wasting by the fielding side so let's go back to that picture of the uh, square uh, so what law is telling us here is that uh, if we do not have uh, uh, sorry when the bowler practices his uh, bowling action, he cannot bowl parallel to the pitch, the match pitch, uh, anywhere um, from one end of the boundary to the other end of the boundary. Uh, that 20, let's call it 25 meters, including uh, the area behind the stumps, anywhere parallel to that, uh, the bowler cannot bowl on that particular area. So typically what you'll find is a bowler, whether a fast bowler or a um, spin bowler, they will bowl their practice deliveries to uh, mid off and mid on, who are in this picture uh, very close to us, or let's say the bottom of the particular picture, either to the right or to the left. That's where the bowler will bowl his or her practice deliveries too. And uh, one thing that we also have to uh, police as umpires to make sure that the condition of the ball is not changed is that that practice delivery uh, should, strictly speaking, be off the ground. OK, so in the air bowled from the bowler to the fielder. Uh, without a bounce, because uh, that bounce, especially if it's a rough outfield, uh, could lead to the unfair changing of the condition of that particular ball. Okay. Are bowlers allowed a trial run-up? Yes, they are. A bowler is permitted to have a trial run-up, provided that there is no time wasting by that fielder and he or she does not damage the pitch. Now, 
we have seen what the law allows and disallows in terms of practice. What happens if a fielding side is guilty of illegal practice? The law has certain penalties for this. Firstly, all forms of practice are subject to law 41.3, 41.9 and 41.12. They should not change the condition of the ball unfairly. They should not waste time and they should not damage the pitch when practicing. If there is a contravention of any of these practice methods allowed, the umpire shall warn the player that this practice is not permitted, inform the other umpire and as soon as practical, both captains for the reason for this action. If the contravention is by a batter at the wicket, the umpire shall inform the other batter and each incoming batter that the warning has been issued and the warning shall apply to the batting side for the remainder of that innings. If during that match there is any further contravention by any player of that team, um, obviously the same warning applies to a fielding side as well. If they contravene any practice, the umpire shall then award five penalty runs to the opposing side, inform the other umpire, the scorers, and as soon as practical, both captains. And if the contravention is during play, then the batters at the wicket also need to be informed. And we need to report the matter to the governing body of who is responsible for that match uh, after the day's play. So that's practice on the field. Done and dusted. Now we move on to law 27, which is the wicket keeper. The wicket keeper has got protective equipment that he or she is allowed to wear according to the law. The wicket keeper is the only fielder permitted to wear gloves and external leg guards. We have all seen fielders fielding close to the bat, your silly mid off or your short mid wicket. They quite often wear uh, shin pads and those shin pads need to be covered by the pants. So they are not external, but are underneath the pants and are not visible externally. If the wicket keeper wears gloves and or external leg guards, they are to be regarded as part of his or her person as long as they remain worn, okay? And we will come to illegal fielding later in this evening's presentation. If by the wicket keeper's actions and positioning, when the ball comes into play, it is apparent that he or she will not be able to carry out the normal duties of a wicket keeper. He or she shall forfeit this right of wearing the protective equipment and being recognized as a wicket keeper uh, for the purposes of uh, stumped and um, limitation of onside fielders as well as encroaching of the pitch. So it does happen quite often in six aside cricket. For those of you who still play or umpire six aside cricket, where they want to use the wicket keeper as a fielder on the boundary. Uh, now it's not really 
still a wicket keeping position if the wicket keeper is on the boundary. So strictly speaking, if a wicket keeper were to go field on the boundary, the law allows him or her to do so, but they should remove their protective equipment, which is the external leg guards, as well as the um, gloves that they might have on. Let's have a look at the gloves that the wiki keepers are allowed to wear. Many years ago, when I first started watching cricket in the 1992 World Cup, uh, South Africa's wicketkeeper was Dave Richardson. And he used to have these big brown leather gloves with webbing between all five fingers. Here you can see that there is webbing between the thumb and the index finger, but there is no webbing allowed between the other fingers. Okay. The webbing between the thumb and the index finger cannot be a stretch material. It used to be a lot bigger and a lot more flexible, almost uh, similar to the pouches that you find on a baseball mitt. Uh, but that is no longer allowed. That material needs to be non-stretch. When the hand wearing the glove has the thumb fully extended, the top edge being taut and not protruding the straight line joining the top of the index finger on the top of the thumb. So what that's saying is if you look at the top of the right hand glove, which is the glove at the top, uh, that is a straight line between the thumb and the index finger. Um, previously, like I mentioned, there used to be a pouch that used to extend above the thumb and the top of the index finger to make for easier catching or at least a larger surface from which the wicket keeper could catch the ball with. Uh, that is no longer permitted. Uh, what is permitted is a straight line between the thumb and the index finger. And again, importantly, no stretch material. That's got to be a tough piece of rubber that the glove is made out of. Where is the wicket keeper allowed to stand? Let's look what the law says. The wicket keeper shall remain wholly behind the wicket at the striker's end from the moment the ball comes into play until a ball is delivered by the bowler and it either touches the bat or person of the striker or passes the wicket at the striker's end or the striker attempts a run. So until either of those three incidents occur, then the wicket keeper needs to remain completely wholly behind, uh, let's call it the bowler's crease. Um, the, the law here says he or she needs to remain wholly behind the wicket. Um, so some people misinterpret that saying that, thinking that he or the wicket keeper needs to be directly behind the stumps. No, that is not the case. You quite often see that wicket keepers stand a little bit outside the off stump because that's where they um, imagine or expect the bowler to mostly bowl their deliveries. Okay, so uh, when the law says wholly behind the wicket, they merely mean that the Wicket keeper needs to remain wholly behind the bowling crease uh, up until either of these three incidents occur. What happens if the wicket keeper uh, moves in front of the stumps before either of these three 
incidents occur, he or she shall be contravening the law and the strikers and umpire shall call and signal no ball as soon as applicable after the delivery has been bowled. OK, remember, Abdullah took us through the no ball law last week and you can only call no ball if a ball has been delivered. Let's get further insight on to the restrictions of the position and the movement of a wicket keeper from the Cricket Digest. Abdullah, please let me know if there is no sound on the video. Hello guys, welcome to my channel. First, let's watch a footage from the T20 match between India and Australia, which happened on 21st of November 2018. Australian wicketkeeper Alex Carey ends up touching the stumps before the ball reaches him. And after referring to the third umpire, it was declared a no ball. So what do you guys think about it? It's a no ball because he touched the stumps? Well, let's find out. Before going any further, let us take a look at the restrictions a wicketkeeper has. He has restrictions both on his movement and position. According to cricket law, after the ball comes into play, well, to know when the ball comes into play, watch the above video. And before the ball reaches the striker, it is unfair if the wicketkeeper makes any significant movement. In this case, umpire will call it dead ball and further action will be invalid. However, he is allowed to make certain movements. Let's take a look at them. He is allowed to move a few steps forward for a slower delivery, but doing so should not bring the stumps in his reach. He is allowed to move laterally like this wicketkeeper in response to the direction in which the ball has been delivered. He is allowed to move in response to the stroke that the striker is playing like this wicketkeeper does, but he has to make sure that he follows the law 27.3.1. Let's see what exactly that law is. The wicketkeeper shall remain wholly behind the wicket. He can't even be parallel to the stumps. From the moment the ball comes into play till either of the following things happens. Ball touches the bat or body of the striker. So he can come ahead of the stumps right after the ball touches the bat no. or batsman's body. Just like this keeper does. Next case. He can come ahead after the ball passes the stumps and he can come ahead if the striker starts running without playing the shot. It will be called a no ball in case of keeper violating this law. In the case of Alex Carey, ball had touched the bat when he broke the wicket. Hence, this is not a violation of law. But he was parallel to the stumps before the ball made contact with the bat. Hence, it was called a no ball. Another instance which needs a mention here is Andy Flowers incident. He is clearly ahead of the stumps even before the ball reached the batsman. It should have been called a no ball but the umpire didn't notice it at all and unfortunately it costed Ridley Jacobs his wicket. Still have any doubts with this? Do let me know in the comment section. If you like the video, hit the like button, share with all your friends. To never miss another update from our channel, don't forget to subscribe and click on the notification button. Right, so that's a good summary of what I have just described. Let us complete the law looking at the restrictions to the movement by a wicketkeeper. After the ball comes into play and before it reaches the striker, it is unfair if the wicketkeeper significantly alters his or her position in relation to the striker's wicket except for the following and this was mentioned in the video movement of a few paces forward for a slow delivery unless in doing so it brings the wicket keeper within the reach of the wicket what's also allowed is lateral movement in response to the direction in which the ball is being delivered as well as movement in response to the stroke that the striker is playing or that his or her actions suggest that he or she might play. 
what do we do if there is illegal movement by the wicketkeeper? Either umpire shall call and signal dead ball and inform the reason, inform the other umpire of the reason for this call. Now, the change of laws effective 1st of October has also brought extra punishment for this. The bowlers and umpire shall award one penalty run for wide or noble if applicable. <clears throat> that hasn't changed. This is new. We now award five penalty runs to the batting side for the illegal movement by a wicketkeeper. OK, no warning on this. Uh, so the wicked keepers need to be aware of this law and the lawmakers have decided to make it instantly punishable by five penalty runs. So quite a serious offence now. We need to inform everybody and also report the incident after the day's play. Here we have a picture of a uh, Bangladeshi wicketkeeper from a test match in 2017 played against South Africa in South Africa at uh, the Senves Oval, as it was known back then. It is now called JB Marks Oval, where Abdullah is uh, currently officiating. So we see that Temba Bavuma has played a lap sweep and the wicket keeper's starting position would have been uh, somewhere behind uh, middle and off stump for the spinner. And now, just as Bavuma plays the shot, the wicket keeper is a couple of meters down leg side, uh, almost at the return crease, and he ended up taking a brilliant catch to dismiss. Temba Bavuma because that ball went off the bat straight in the air and into the wicketkeeper's gloves. So is that legal or is that illegal? Um, please, guys, the catch was fairly taken. Uh, type in your answers. Uh, say to me uh, out court or uh, dead ball and five penalty runs for illegal movement. Uh, what do you think, having just seen uh, all of the uh, video as well as the law described to you in the previous few slides? Uh, let's engage. Let us make a decision out court or dead ball and five penalty runs to the betting side. Please punch in your answers in the chat box and we shall look through it after the presentation. Lastly, on the wicketkeeper law, what happens if the wicketkeeper interferes with the striker or the um, striker interferes with the wicketkeeper? Law says that if in playing at the ball or in the legitimate defense of his wicket, the striker interferes with the wicketkeeper, he or she shall not be out except possibly for obstructing the field and the ball from being caught. Okay, if there's an appeal, then the umpires would have to make a decision on obstructing the field, um, not of um, hit wicket or hit the ball twice because a Better, we will learn on Wednesday tomorrow. A striker is allowed to hit the ball twice in defending his or her stumps, except if it prevents a catch from being taken. And that catch would normally be taken by the wicket keeper standing up to the stumps for a spin bowler. Okay. Moving on to law 28, which is the fielder. And what you will notice is that similar principles apply 
for the movement and the positioning of fielders uh, versus the wicketkeeper. Because remember that a wicketkeeper is a fielder as well. Of course, there are more restrictions as well to the outfielders that we shall now look at. Before we go into the law, another pop quiz. I won't ask you for the answer because I'll show you the answer in the video, uh, but think about it quickly. Is a normal fielder allowed to use wicketkeeper equipment? Let us see via this video whether it is allowed or not. Barbaraz is wearing a glove and actually caught the ball and then that was deemed illegal fielding. As you can see at the bottom of the screen, right, the first delivery, there's five penalty runs and that's because of illegal fielding because Barbarazam picked up Rizwan's glove and used it to catch the ball, to catch the ball. Okay, so as you all know, Baba Razam is captain of Pakistan and is not a wicketkeeper. But what you saw there is that uh, the wicketkeeper going to field the ball removed his glove, Rizwan, and put it on the ground. And then Baba Razam jokingly picked up the glove put it on, and then as the throw came in from Rizwan, Baba Razam caught the ball with the wicked keeper glove on, which does not belong to him. And the umpires rightfully awarded five penalty runs to the fielding side, sorry, to the batting side, which is the West Indies. And as you saw there, the Pakistani players were quite bemused. They didn't know why. It just goes to show that even international captains do not know the laws of cricket because this law has been around for a long time and this incident happened uh, a few months ago. And so great that the commentators at least knew the law and they were able to explain it quite clearly. Um, but guys, make sure that you know your laws and apply them correctly and are able to verbally mention to the players what they've done wrong and the punishment for their mistake. OK, so that is why it's critically important for us as umpires to know our laws, and that is why the pass mark for all of our exams is 80% um, because we need to know our laws through and through. So I'm just going to play it one more time for you guys to see that uh, Rizwan left his position as a wicket keeper, took his glove off, threw the ball in, and by that stage, Baba Razam had put the glove on, and that is why Pakistan were nailed five penalty runs awarded to the batting side, the West Indies. wearing a glove and actually caught the ball and then that was deemed illegal fielding as you can see at the bottom of the screen 
right. The first delivery, there's five penalty runs. And that's because of illegal fielding, because Barbara Azam picked up Rizwan's glove and used it to catch the ball, to catch the OK, hope you all understood that. So. How is a fielder allowed to feel the ball? The law says that a fielder may feel the ball with any part of his or her person. However, he or she will be deemed to have fielded the ball illegally if while the ball is in play, he or she willfully, and that word willfully is quite important, uses anything other than part of his or her person to field the ball. It will also be regarded as illegal fielding if the fielder extends his or her clothing and uses this to field the ball. And we've got a nice picture to illustrate that point. It will also be illegal fielding if the fielder discards a piece of clothing, equipment or any other object which subsequently makes contact with the ball. So let me give you an example of that. Uh, you noticed that uh, Rizwan discarded his glove as he was running after the ball so that he could throw the ball easily with a glove off. Um, if Rizwan had thrown at the stumps and the ball had hit the glove on the floor that he had discarded, then that would also be considered illegal fielding. Why? Because he willfully discarded a piece of equipment which subsequently made, made contact with the ball. OK, so forget about uh, Baba Razam getting involved there. Just imagine that Rizwan had discarded his glove as he did, ran after the ball, picked the ball up, threw the ball towards the stumps, and the ball bounced on the glove that had been discarded. That is also considered illegal fielding and also punishable by five penalty runs awarded to the batting side. OK, uh, similarly, if a cap is discarded by a fielder when he or she is chasing after a ball, um, it feels or seems like fielders think that if they discard their cap, they will run faster. So they quite often discard their cap. Uh, we as umpires just need to be careful whether that cap was willfully discarded, removed from the top of the fielder's heads um, by the fielder, or if it blew off by the wind generated by the fielder running. OK, if the cap flies off by mistake because of the wind generated by the fielder running, and then the fielder throws the ball in and it hits that cap. It shall not be regarded as illegal fielding because that cap came off the head uh, accidentally. If, however, that cap came off the head because it was willfully discarded by the fielder and the ball is thrown against the willfully discarded cap, then it will be five penalty runs. OK, so that is why I mentioned earlier the word willfully is very important. There it's stated in the law, it is not illegal fielding if the ball in play makes contact with a piece of clothing, equipment or any other object which has accidentally fallen from the fielder's person. This here is quite willful um, extending of a fielder's clothing. OK, that's point number two. So that is considered illegal fielding. So 
How do we as umpires handle illegal fielding? The law tells us that if a fielder illegally fields the ball, the ball shall immediately become dead. We came across this in the dead ball law last week, and Abdullah did mention that in such cases, even though the ball becomes automatically dead, it is good umpiring practice for you to call and signal dead ball. Why? Because the players, as we've just seen in the Rizwan and Baba Razam incident, the players do not know these laws. So you calling and signaling Signaling dead ball is going to make them aware that the ball has become dead and they will now know that punishment is coming their way. As always, the penalty for a no ball or wide shall stand if applicable. And any runs completed by the batters shall be credited to the batting side together with the run in progress if the batters had already crossed at the instant of the offence. Okay. The ball shall not count as one of the over. The umpires shall award five penalty runs and we shall inform and report. Okay, so quite harsh punishment for illegal fielding. That is why players need to be educated about it. Now, what happens if the wicketkeeper, as you saw, Rizwan had a helmet, but when a fast bowler is bowling, what does a wicketkeeper do? He or she stands back and discards his or her helmet and puts it behind the wicket keeper during that over when the fast bowler is bowling. So what happens if the ball hits that helmet that is behind the wicket keeper? The law says that protective helmets when not in use by fielders should be placed on the ground behind the wicket keeper and in line with both sets of stumps. Why? Because that is quite an unlikely place for the ball to end up. If, however, a protective helmet belonging to the fielding side is on the ground and the ball while in play strikes it, the ball shall immediately become dead. But good umpiring practice is for either umpire to call and signal dead ball. Why? Because A, not all players know this law, but also B, not all players or both umpires will see the ball hitting the wicket keeper's helmet, which is behind the wicket keeper on the ground. Okay, uh, it's happened to me before in a game. Uh, I was a striker's end umpire, and the bowler's end umpire did not see the ball hitting the helmet behind the wicket keeper, so I had to call. Uh, and signal dead ball and inform him that the ball had hit the helmet behind the wicket keeper. And then he signaled five penalty runs to the scorers. There it is. We need to award five penalty runs to the batting side. And any runs completed by the batters before the ball strikes the protective helmet shall be scored together with the run in progress if the batters had already crossed at the instant that the ball struck the helmet. Okay, so even if they haven't completed that run, as long as they had crossed when the ball hit the helmet behind the wicket keeper, they shall be credited with that run. Um, could be a buy if the ball didn't strike the bat. And there will be credited five penalty runs. The wicket keeper has got restrictions for movement, and so do all the other fielders. Let us see what these restrictions are. 
any movement by any fielder excluding the wicket keeper after the ball comes into play and before the ball reaches the striker is unfair except for minor adjustments to stance or position in relation to the striker's wicket we all know from a young age when we played cricket coaches always preach that the fielders should walk in with the bowler so that is allowed what is also allowed is movement by any fielder other than a close in fielder towards the striker or the striker's wicket that does not significantly alter the position of the fielder so you cannot walk in so fast from extra cover that you are in a short cover catching position by the time the bowler delivers the ball what is also allowed is movement by any fielder in response to the stroke that the striker is playing or that his actions suggest that he intends to play if you think back to the picture of Temba Bavuma being caught down the leg side by the Bangladeshi wicketkeeper you will have seen that the slip fielder was also running from his position at first slip he was now standing behind the stumps and running further down leg side also because he was anticipating the shot that Temba Bavuma was playing so that movement is described in point number 3 here it is allowed as long as it is not distracting the striker and of course being behind the striker it would not be distracting the striker so perfectly legal by the fielder as well as the wicket keeper what happens if there is illegal movement by a fielder either umpire shall call and signal dead ball and inform the other umpire why and then once again if there is a wide or a no ball that one run penalty will always stand similar to the wicket keeper's punishment for illegal movement there are five penalty runs awarded to the batting side for illegal movement by a fielder also a new law no warning straight to punishment obviously we need to inform as well as report the incident it is now being regarded as a serious offence hence the five run penalty without warning and the reporting after the day's play abdullah that is me done with my laws for today you will please now take us through laws 29 30 and 31 after which we shall open the floor to questions that have been asked in the chat box as well as any other questions relating to the laws presented or the exam over to you abdullah thank you so much uh, thomas good evening um, to you um, and the rest of the attendees i'm kicking off with law 21 and it covers when the wicket is down we will be looking at a video that will explain to us exactly how how the law explains how the wicket is down the wicket is down the wicket is put down when one or both bales are removed from the top of the stumps or a stump is struck out of the ground the situation can be brought about in the following ways by the ball by the batsman's bat by the batsman's bat if he or she lets go of it or even by some flying part of a bat if it breaks by the batsman's clothing or body or some part of his or her equipment falling off by a fielder with his or her hand or arm providing the same hand is holding the ball 
If the bale merely bounces and comes to rest back on the stumps, then that is not out. The wicket is down at the precise moment that both ends of either bale are removed from the stumps. Right about now. Should you have further questions on this tricky subject, such as how to put the wicket down when one or both bales have already been removed, head over to Law 29 in MCC's The Laws of Cricket. The so the important part um, that I want to emphasize is when is the wicket down? When one or both bales are removed from the top of the stumps. As soon as they remove from the top of the stumps, then the wicket is down. In this picture, it shows you how to put the wicket down when bales accidentally fell off the stumps while the ball was in play. Example of this, let's say uh, the bowler uh, bowls in and delivers the ball and now the wind accidentally or the wind blows off the, the bales. Or even a bowler running in, delivering the ball, then with his or her knee takes off the bales. We heard last week that if that happens, either umpire to call and signal no ball, but if that ball gets delivered and if the batsman needed in the outfield, the ball is not dead, runs can still be scored, but either umpire should call and signal no ball, but the bales are now lying on the ground and the ball is still in play and the batters are, are now running. So what this picture shows us is how to put the wickets down if the bells fell off accidentally while the ball is still in play. So this is the correct method to put this wicket down when the bells accidentally falls off while the ball is still in play. So this is one of those methods. So you need to take the ball in one hand, the stump in one hand, and then simultaneously with the ball, it's, uh, with your one hand holding the stump and the other hand holding the ball and, and simultaneously taking out one of the stumps. This is one of the methods if the bells while in play fell off accidentally. The other method to put the wicker down if the bells fell off accidentally is to take the ball and hit one of the stumps completely out the ground. A third method to do, is, to do it is to throw the ball so hard that it takes one or two or even three stumps completely out of the ground. So that is the three method, methods to put the wicket down if the ball, if, if the bells fell off accidentally while the ball is still in play. So this is the correct method to do it. This is the incorrect method to do it. And this is in all my years of playing before I became an umpire. This is how I put the wicket down on many occasions. And because a lot of the players didn't know the law, we actually put the wicket down in uh, using this method. The batter was the run, was was the run out. Batters didn't know the law either, and they just accepted it. So this is the incorrect method. Why? You'll see the stump in one hand, the ball in the other hand, in the previous slide, we saw it needs to happen together with the ball in one hand, stump in the other hand, and you take out the stump holding the ball and take it out simultaneously. So this is the incorrect method. This is the correct method. Is this wicker down? In the video we saw, and I also emphasized the point that if one or both bales are completely removed from the top of the stumps, then the wicket is down. So ask yourself the question, is one or both bales completely removed from the top of the stumps? If your answer to that question is yes, then this wicket is down. So the answer to that question is, yes, the one bell is completely removed from the top of the stump. So yes, this wicket is down. 
Also, if while the ball is in play, let's say only one bail whether accidentally the, the wind let's say the wind blows it off or the 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 bowler um, accidentally in in his or her delivery stride only took off one ball bowled the ball the 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 batter uh, uh, hit the ball into the covers and they start running how do you put the wicket then down if there's only one uh, bail on it do you need to remove uh, the stump with one ball with the ball in one hand and the and uh, the ball in one hand and the stump in the other hand and, and simultaneously remove it. In this case, the law say no. Why? If there's still one veil on the stumps in the groove to put this wicker down, all you need to do is to remove the other bail. It's only if both bails while the ball is in play, the wind blew it off, or the bowler uh, uh, took it off with his or her uh, foot or hand, then you need to, to, to put the wicker down. You need to then remove the stump simultaneously with the ball in one hand, uh, ball in one hand and the stump in the other, like, as in the first picture. But if there are still one bell left on the stumps or in the groove, to put this wicker down, don't need to take a stump out of the ground. All you can do is to remove the other bell, you will then put the wicket down. When is a batter out of his or her ground? Let's look at the video and see what the law say when this happens. Batsman out of his or her ground. When a batsman is out of his or her ground, he or she risks being stumped or run out. So when is a batsman out of his or her ground? According to Law 30, a batsman shall be considered to be out of his or her ground unless the bat he or she is holding or some part of the batsman's person is grounded behind the popping crease at that end. Here, for example, the bat is on the crease marking, but not behind it, which means the batsman is, most definitely, out. But would the batsman be out now? Both the bat and the batsman are over the line, but neither the bat nor any part of the batsman's person is grounded, i.e. in contact with the ground. So, yes, that's out again. This being cricket, there is an exception to this part of the law. If a batsman, who must be running or diving, has already made his or her ground, either with the bat or any part of the body, but subsequently loses contact with the ground while continuing his or her forward momentum as the wicket is put down, he or she will be not out. Next question, and this can be a bit of a headache, what constitutes each batsman's ground? Well, when one batsman is in a ground, i.e. grounded behind a popping crease, then the ground at the other end belongs to the other batsman. If neither is in his or her ground, for example, when they are both running between wickets or even stationary, each ground belongs to the batsman who is nearest to it. If both batsmen are level, then where they were before drawing level is the deciding factor. Of course, this being cricket, there are further delightful complications, such as two batsmen in the same ground, or three when you have a striker with a runner. But never fear, all mental anguish will clear with a little quiet meditation and reference to Law 30 in the Blue Book. So where shall the non-striker be positioned when a ball gets delivered? The law guide us here by telling us that the non-striker, when standing at the bowler's end, should be on the opposite side of the wicket to that from which the ball is being delivered, unless 
the better ask the umpire if he or she can stand on the other side. But otherwise, the non-striker must stand on the opposite side from which the ball is being delivered. Looking at this picture, and before I'm going to reveal the answer, I would like the attendees to, in the chat box, to state whether this is out, run out, or not out, run out. So the keeper's taking out, took off the bells. The batter, whose bat is behind the popping crease, but not in his hand. Would you say this is out or not out? Before I reveal the answer, I will give uh, you a few seconds to think about it. Put it in, put your answers in the chat box. And I will reveal the answer in the next 10 seconds. Okay, 10 seconds is almost up. I will now be revealing the answer. This is out runner. Why? The bat needs to be in the hand of the striker. Because this bat is not in the striker's hand, even though it is behind the popping crease, because this bat is not in the hand of the striker, that's the reason why this, uh, the batter in this picture is, is out. The last law that I'm covering for this evening, before we will open the floor for Q&A, is the appeals law. Let's see what the law tells us about when an appeal is made. Firstly, the law tells us that our umpire shall not give out any better without an appeal being made. There must be an appeal before you as the umpire can give the, feel, the, the better out. So just to confirm again, even though you hear a uh, your better plays at the ball, you hear uh, the nick, you 100% convinced that this better has edged the, the ball, but there's no appeal. And believe me, it actually happened on more than one occasion. You hear this clear nick, uh, better playing away from the body. I hear this nick. For whatever reason, none of the, uh, the fielding side members appealed. Even though the batter touched the ball, according uh, to, my, uh, to me, uh, I could, cannot lift my finger because the law guides us here by telling us there needs to be an appeal before you can give the batter out. Also, the law adds that, and you do find one or two honest batters out there, that at times, and I've actually seen this, it, uh, I've, uh, um, I've seen it once with uh, Asim Amla in a test match playing away uh, from his body. There was no appeal, but Asim Amla put his bat under his arm and he walked off. There was no appeal, uh, but uh, Amla felt he touched the ball, and we all know Amla was an honest player. He then put the bat under his arm and walked off the field. So the law tells us in that case, if the batter, there's nothing stopping uh, the batter from leaving his or her wicket, even though an appeal has not been made. But there is one e exception to, to this, and the exception will be in the next slide. So what is this exception? If a batter left his or her wicket under 
the impression that they are dismissed. What do you do in that case? The law tells us that the umpire needs to intervene if the umpire is satisfied that the batter not having been given out and that batter now left the wicket under uh, a misapprehension of being out. You know, I'll give you an example of this. It actually happened uh, to me on more than one occasion. So the law tell us if the batter thinks he or she is out and then leaves the wicket but actually is not out, either umpire needs to intervene immediately by calling and signaling dead ball to prevent any further action by the fielding side. And the umpire then needs to inform this batter, batter, you're actually not out. I'll give you two examples to illustrate this point clearly. And it actually happened uh, to me on more than one occasion. First example, the bat, the, uh, uh, it was a fairly, a uh, windy day, uh, batter played at the ball, edged the ball to slip. Meanwhile, I called no ball for bowler overstepping the front foot. Batter did not hear the call of no ball due to the, the howling wind. Batter, because edged the ball to second slip, batter put his bat under his arm and started walking towards the dressing room. So uh, the batter then left his wicket. Batter was now outside his crease. First, uh, second slip, seeing this, wanted to sigh at the stumps. So now the law um, gives us power as umpires to intervene in this situation where the batter thinking he was out, in my case, edging the ball to slip, thinking uh, out, put the bat under his arm and started walking, but he didn't hear the call of no ball because of, of the win. I then intervened immediately by calling and signaling dead ball why did, did I do that and why does the law tell us to do it? It's, it's to prevent further action by the fielding side because second slip was on the verge of throwing at the stumps, trying to run out the, the striker. So only if in cases where a batter thinks he's out, but he's actually not out, you as umpire then need to intervene. Another, another example. Uh, that uh, happened to me in a game. The uh, batter edged the ball to second slip. I was, I was the strikers in umpire. Without looking back, the batter put uh, the bat under his arm and started walking towards the, uh, the dressing room. So edged the ball to slip. This was, uh, in this case, it was first slip put the bat under his arm and started walking. Meanwhile, the ball landed about two feet in front of first slip. So, i.e., the ball did not carry. But batter, batter didn't even look around, immediately put the bat under his arm, thinking he was out, started walking towards um, the pavilion. Again, as strikers in umpire, I intervene because what did first slip try to do? Seeing that the batter now um, thinking he was out on his way to the pavilion, the first slip tried to run out the batter. I intervened by calling and signaling dead ball. Again, an example, and only in these cases where batters thinking they're out leave their wicket, this is where the law allows you to intervene as an umpire. And you need to be quick by calling and signaling a dead ball to prevent the fielding side from running out the batter. And you will then recall the batter and tell him or uh, batter. So in my case, the, the, um, the ball actually drops short, hence you're not out. 
continue betting. And in my first example, I said to the better, you're not out because uh, I called uh, no ball uh, for front foot. Um, uh, yes, you didn't hear it, uh, but you now may continue betting. So when, it's, uh, when uh, you recall a better, the law also guides us here up until when can you recall a better? And the law tells us that a better may be recalled at any time up to the instant when the ball comes into play for the next delivery. So from the moment the ball is dis uh, the batter is dismissed up until the bowler takes his or her first step, because that is when the ball comes into play for the next delivery. Up until that bowler takes his or her first step, that is the period. So from the moment the batter is dismissed up until the bowler takes the, uh, his or her first step, you can then still recall the batsman. The moment the, batter, the, the bowler takes his or her first step to bowl the next delivery, that, that window close, you then not allowed to recall uh, the batter. And when it comes to the final wicket, uh, of uh, the innings in terms of recalling the batter, that should be made at the instance when the umpires leave the field. So the moment the umpires put their foot over the boundary to leave the field, then according to law, you're not allowed to recall the batter anymore. So in terms of timings of appeals, do you need to appeal immediately? So uh, if uh, there's an edge or if the ball strikes the pad, do you need to appeal immediately? Can you think about it? Uh, can you ask someone else? Uh, well, what do they think? What is the timings of appeals according to the law? The law tells us that an appeal is still valid as long as it's made before the bowler begins his or her run-up. And if there's no run-up, his or her bowling action for the next delivery and before time has been called. So I'll use an example to illustrate this point in terms of timing of, uh, of appeals. So the window period for that allows you still to appeal uh, to make an appeal. Let's say the, the batter adds the ball to the keeper. You hear the edge, but initially there's no appeal. And you're thinking, I heard the edge, there's no appeal. And we, just, uh, uh, we saw in the previous uh, two slides ago that you cannot give the batter out if no appeal has been uh, made. So. There's no appeal. You clearly heard the edge. You play, the batter played away from, from his or her body. But because there's been no appeal, you cannot lift your finger. For that appeal, that appeal stays valid until the bowler takes his or her first step for the next delivery and before time has been called. So what that means is, so, so in my example, no appeal has been uh, made, but you heard the edge. Then the ball gets thrown up from the keeper to slip to a point, and now it goes in the circle, it's gonna go back to the bowler. Before the, let's say the ball gets to the bowler, the cover fielder, comes to you and uh, and and say, Ampa, how's that? I heard a sound. I, I'm appealing for court behind. According to the laws of cricket, that appeal is still valid. And according to the laws, you can still give the striker out court behind. And why is that appeal still valid? Because the bowler did not take his or her first step to bowl the next delivery. If that bowler took that first step to bowl the next delivery, so the moment the bowler takes that first step, the ball then becomes alive. Once that first step is taken, 
that appeal now becomes invalid. So there is quite a, a lengthy um, waiting period uh, or period for for that appeal to be valid. So from the moment it happened until the next, the uh, the bowler takes his or her first step to bowl the next delivery and before time has been called. Also, even the call of over doesn't invalidate an appeal. As long as it's made prior to the start of the following over, meaning the next over starts and the bowler did not take his or her first step yet, that appeal is still valid, but there is an exception provided time has not been called. So once time is called, that appeal is not valid anymore. So just an example of this, you know, use a, uh, a um, similar or the same example. It's the last ball of the over, better plays away from uh, uh, from her body, clear it's, you convince this it's, but there's no appeal. And you, according to the law, you cannot give the batter out without an appeal. So you didn't hear an appeal, last ball of the over, ball is now dead, you as bowler Sinapa, now call over. So as you're walking towards your new position now at the striker's end, Let's say the the um, square leg fielder now comes to you and say, um, "Umpa, I heard something there from 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 square leg position. I'm appealing for uh, caught behind by the keeper. How's that?" The law allows you to answer that appeal because yes, over was called, but the 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 following over did not start yet. The bowler did not take his or her first step yet. So you still fell in that window period where you can, where the appeal is still uh, valid. So again, you can see there's quite a, a window period uh, in terms of timings um, of the uh, appeal. Uh, but what, <laughs> what I can tell you is, if there's been no appeal initially, and um, so in my last example, only at the end of the over, the bowler now comes to you. Uh, sorry, the, uh, there was no appeal from the bowler, no, none from the keeper, none from the slip. Someone at squarely comes to you and appeals. Even though the appeal is still valid, I would rather go, no, not out. I didn't hear anything. Just imagine you now give the, the striker out court behind from, from neither bowler, nor keeper, nor slips. Someone uh, at the boundary, because yes, the law tells us any fielder can appeal. But just imagine there's an appeal uh, from square leg, none from the bowler, none from the batter, none, sorry, none, none from any of the slips, any of the close infielders, someone on the boundary appeal, I will say no, not out, even though the, the appeal is still, is still valid. But uh, that's just a, a, a side note. But in terms of timings of appeal, yeah, I've just mentioned what the window period is. So how do you uh, appeal? The law tells us that an appeal of how's that covers all ways. All you need to do is you need to appeal how's that, and it covers all ways of appeals. You do not need to specify um, uh, how's that, umpire. I need to. I'm appealing for LBW, or I'm appealing for. For how's that? I'm appealing for court behind, or I'm appealing for stumping. You do not need to spe specify. The law tells us that all you need to do when you appeal, all you need to say is how's that, and that covers all methods of uh, appeal. In terms of answering of appeals and who answers the appeals. The strikers in umpire, so they are we'll next on tomorrow we'll see there are nine modes of dismissals. Three of them needs to be answered by the strikers in umpire. The other six needs to uh, uh, the bowlers in umpire needs to answer those appeals. So which appeals must the strikers in umpire answer? Hit wicket, stump and run out at the wicketkeeper's end. Those three appeals, 
the strikers in Ampire needs to answer. The other six, caught behind, L LBW, obstructing, hit the ball twice. We'll see tomorrow the modes of dismissal. All the others, the bowlers in Ampire needs to answer those appeals. Also importantly, when an appeal is made, each umpire needs to answer the appeal that falls within his or her jurisdiction. Meaning, if there's a stumping, who needs to answer that appeal? The strikers in umpire. You cannot say uh, refer that to the bowlers in umpire or the players cannot appeal uh, to the bowlers in umpire. The strikers in umpire needs to answer on the stumping appeal. So when a batter has been given not out, either umpire may answer an appeal if, if it is on a further matter and is within his or her jurisdiction. So does the law allow umpires to consult? Let's see what the law say. So yes, the law allows the two umpires to consult. And it starts by saying, each umpire needs to answer any appeal that falls within that umpire's jurisdiction. That's the law start off by saying that. So if there is a court behind appeal, who needs to answer the, uh, that appeal? The law tells us the bowlers in umpire needs to answer uh, that appeal. That is not does not fall under the jurisdiction of the strikers in umpire, the bowlers in umpire needs to answer that appeal. The uh, LBW, who answers that appeal? Bowlers in umpire answers uh, that appeal. There are times, and, and it happened before, where sometimes the, the wind blows and there's a court behind appeal and the the uh, bowlers in umpire, let's say the wind is blowing, it's downwind and, and the sound goes away from the bowlers in umpire, but you as strikers in umpire, uh, bowlers in didn't hear the, the, the edge, strikers in umpire uh, heard it, who needs to answer that appeal? It is the bowlers in umpire that needs to answer that appeal. And let's say the bowlers in umpire say, no, it's uh, no, not out. I didn't hear anything. You as strikers in umpire cannot intervene by saying, uh, by going over and say, bowlers in umpire, uh, I've heard the nick, please give the batter out. No, it does not fall within your uh, jurisdiction. The bowlers in umpire needs to, to make that call and only the bowlers in umpire can make that call. Yes, as umpires, we do help each other, and there are certain signals that we do make to assist each other, especially uh, if the wind's blowing, they, um, we do have um, certain signals that we've discussed before the game start, especially if the wind's blowing, where you can assist your colleague. So if you heard the strikers in, and let's say the wind's blowing, um, US bowlers in umpire didn't hear it, you can quickly just glance, just with your eyes, you don't need to turn your head, just with your eyes, uh, uh, um, glance at your strikers in umpire. And again, it's uh, it's pre, pre match signals that you've discussed. There's a certain signal that you've made. If the strikers in heard the edge, the strikers in can give you indication by a certain uh, sign, by maybe, let's say, touching the, uh, his hand or touching his ear. I'm just using an example. If you see that sign, you know the strikers in heard, heard an edge, and you can give the batter out. The point I'm trying to make is, in my example of the of the court behind appeal, it falls under the bowlers in. It's the bowlers in umpire's uh, call. Strikers in umpire cannot intervene. Although, uh, although we do have prearranged signals that you can help your colleague. But to come back to uh, consultation by umpires, the law allows for this. An example, when can you uh, consult? Let's say there's an LBW appeal. You cannot go over to your colleague and say, guys, wait, 
Uh, first, I want to go speak to my colleague whether he or she heard an uh, edge or whether that was a bit too high. No, you, in those instances, you cannot consult. You need to uh, you need to make that call on your own. But there are times when you can consult. An example of this, the ball, uh, the striker edges the ball to first slip. The bowler then uh, uh, gets in between you and first slip. You as the bowler is in a pass. The bowler gets in between you and first slip. So you cannot, you could not see whether the ball clearly carried into the hands of first slip. In this instance, you, the law allows you to consult your partner. So you call and signal dead ball, you get the ball, you go over to your partner for consultation. You tell your, your partner, Polo was in my way, couldn't see whether the catch was clearly taken. Your partner will tell you, yes, I saw it clearly. The ball clearly went into the slip fielder's hands. You say, thank you. You can now give the batter out court. So the, that's an example of where uh, uh, the two umpires can consult about a decision. But there are instances like with the LB uh, appeal or the court behind appeal, you cannot stop the game, go to your colleague if there's an LB appeal and consult and now uh, and now say, okay, I've consulted my colleague, my colleague says this bad, okay, I'm now going to give no, not out. No, if it's an LB appeal, you need to give it out. But instances where, uh, in my example, you couldn't see if the catch was taken clearly, the law allows you to consult. And if after you've consulted your colleague and let's say strikers can tell you, um, I'm not 100% sure, I don't think that ball carried or I'm not sure the ball carried. If there is doubt after consulting, the decision shall be not doubt. Are you allowed to withdraw an appeal? Yes, the law allows you. The law tells us that. The captain of the fielding side is allowed to withdraw an appeal, but only after obtaining the consent of the umpire within whose jurisdiction the appeal fell. And if, you, if such consent is given, the umpire then shall revoke the decision and recall the batter. So yes, the captain at any time is allowed to withdraw a his or her appeal. The law, the law allows for that. Again, there's a, there's a window period for this withdrawing of an appeal, and that window period is that it needs to be made before the ball comes into play for the next delivery. So before the bowler takes his or her first step to bowl the next delivery, uh, that is when the that window period uh, um, ends. So it needs to be, um, the appeal needs to be withdrawn before the bowler takes his or her first step for the next delivery. Or, and if the innings has been completed, as soon as the umpires left the field, that appeal then cannot be withdrawn anymore. Let's look at an, uh, of an example that happened in uh, 2012 where an appeal was withdrawn. Putting on 162 for the third wicket. Then in the final ball of the session, incredible controversy. Owen Morgan thought he'd scored four here after some clumsy fielding by Pravan Kumar. And the batsman began walking off the tee. Replay showed, though, the ball never actually touched the rope. So when the bales came off with Morgan and Bell on their way back to the pavilion, India appealed, perhaps unsportingly, for the unlikeliest run out you will ever see. And the letter of the law said Bell had to go. And a dramatic and savoury end, it seemed, to a brilliant innings of 137. Bell bemused, the crowd furious, but England 254 for four. Where the second session had ended in booze and acrimony, and the England batsman walked back onto the field after tea. 
It was to astonish stares and then huge cheers to see Ian Bell amongst them. During the interval, Indian captain MS Dhoni had sportingly withdrawn their successful appeal over Bell's controversial run-out. A big call in every sense. The spirit of the game prevailing over the letter of the law. But England were determined to make their own headlines with their batting. Owen Morgan bringing up his half-century in stunning. Thank you so much, Tom. That is my section of the laws that I'm covering. I'm now ending uh, back to you. We can open now the floor for the Q&A session. Thank you, Abdullah. We have completed our presentation of laws 26 through to 31. I shall now go through the chat box to reveal questions that were asked during the presentation. What I see is the answer to my appeal for Temba Bavuma being caught down legside by a wicketkeeper who had moved in anticipation of the shot. And everybody seems to have answered out court. Uh, there are two no's, um, which I think was referring to the next question I asked. That was whether Baba Razam is allowed to use the wicket keeper's uh, glove, even though he's not wicket keeper. Uh, we saw the result of that particular incident was five penalty runs awarded to the batting side. So let's move on to the questions which have been asked. Uh, Sagar says, how does the change of wicketkeeper, how is it defined? Does the fielding side need to inform the umpire of the change and that the new wicketkeeper will be allowed to use gloves? Abdullah, you want to take that one? Yes, Tom, uh, Saga, thanks, uh, thanks for your question. When it comes to changing of the wicketkeeper, any of the nominated players may keep at any time. So of the 11 players, any of the nominated players can keep at any time. It's only when uh, the law tells us that if a substitute keeper uh, if a substitute wants to now keep wicket, that substitute needs the consent of uh, the umpires before the substitute is allowed to to keep. So, so that's uh, firstly. So, if there is a need to change the keeper uh, in the game, the any of the nominated players may keep. I've seen examples of this. I've experienced it. The, uh, the, the regular keeper is also a bowler, and now the captain feels like he, he or she wants the keeper now to bowl a few off spinners. I've seen an uh, example of this was uh, the, uh, one of the, car the reserve uh, keeper of South Africa, Heinrich Klaassen. He's also a fairly good uh, spinner, and there were times uh, where the captain asked Heinrich uh, Klaassen to take off the pads. The pads was taken by one of the other nominated players and then Klaassen bowled a few uh, deliveries. So, yes, if the uh, captain asks you, would like to change keeper, you, you'll allow it because any of the nominated players uh, can keep. But when it comes to substitute, wanting to keep, you need the consent um, of the opposing captain. And this new keeper now uh, now can wear the gloves and external leg guards because this new keeper will now be regarded as the wicked keeper of, of the side. You also need to be cognizant of um, and uh, the match situation uh, will play a Are you still there? Seem to have lost you. Let me just check if Abdullah is still on the list. 
looks like he has left the meeting. Um, so I think I'll just finish what he was saying about the match situation dictating. Um, Heinrich Klaassen being a spinner uh, would want to bowl in the fourth or fifth day of a test match. And remember that law allows a substitute wicket keeper to keep wicket. However, um, only by the consent of the umpires. And so it is not allowed to be a tactical substitution uh, to bring on a new wicket keeper. Um, for example, if um, Quinton de Kock, the normal wicket keeper for South Africa, was keeping wicket, and um, then they decided that they wanted Quinton de Kock to bowl. Um, he cannot, you cannot injure, uh, for example, if another player was injured, then a substitute comes on for that injured player, but not Quinton de Kock. You cannot then have the substitute take the gloves so that Quinton de Kock can bowl. Okay, um, so a wicket, a substitute is allowed to keep wicket uh, only through injury and illness, not through a tactical substitution. Uh, just coming back to um, the question by Segar, yes, uh, anyone can keep wicket as explained by Abdullah, but um, the umpires need to be informed by uh, the fielding side of the change of wicket keeper, uh, and that new wicket keeper will wear all the protective equipment. So in the situation that we saw between Baba Razam and Rizwan was that um, Rizwan was still the nominated wicket keeper, still had both leg guards on and one glove on, and Baba Azam picking up the discarded glove was not an official wicket keeper, and that is why they got punished. Okay. Um, yeah. Moving on. Uh, Tom, I'm back online. Yeah, I lost, just lost you for a split second. I, we, I reconnected uh, quickly. Uh, and uh, thanks for, for, um, for finalizing the question. I just wanted to, uh, to add to that, Tom. Sure. Um, you also need to be uh, just wary of uh, fielding captain maybe trying to waste time. Mm. by wanting to constantly change a uh, wicket keeper but the match situation you usually will dictate that dictate that let's say it's the uh, five day test match uh, last hour of, uh, close to the um, end of play maybe they the fielding side would want to waste time and by now they ask you uh, I now want player X to keep to to put on the pads. You allow it, and then a few hours later, the captain comes to you. Uh, now, but I now want player player Y to keep wicket. You just need to be wary. Match situation. Uh, if you feel like they're trying to waste time, you can actually uh, say no. This is time wasting. You stick to one keeper. Thanks, Tom. I just thought I want to add that final point to that question. Perfect. Thank you. Good point, Abdullah. Next question is from Anil. Can a close infielder wear the wicket keeper's helmet that would normally be put behind the wicket keeper in line with the striker's stump? You want to take that one, Abdullah? Yes, Tom. Um, yes, Anil. Yes, the close infielder can wear the keeper's helmet. No, nothing wrong. Can wear the keeper's helmet, but the only uh, two pieces of equipment that the keep that uh, none of the other fielders can use is the gloves and we external pads. Those are the only two pieces of equipment that other fielders are not allowed to wear of the keeper. But any other equipment like uh, the helmet, yes, silly point is allowed to wear the key keeper's helmet for safety if silly point feels like it. Over to you, Tom. Perfect. Thanks, Dula. Uh, next question is from Saturguna. If the ball is in play and strikes the towel hanging from a fielder's waist, is it considered to be illegal fielding or not? 
I will take this one, uh, Satraguna. Uh, if the towel is tucked into the fielder or the bowler's waist and the ball hits the towel while it is still on the person of the fielder, then it is not regarded as illegal fielding. Why? Because the towel is part of the fielder's person when it is tucked in. Similar to a cap, if the ball hits a fielder's cap while worn by the fielder, that is not illegal fielding because the cap is worn. So any piece of clothing or equipment while properly worn by a fielder or uh, tucked into that fielder's clothing as a towel is tucked in, that is considered as part of the fielder's person and shall not be considered as illegal fielding. Um, if the towel drops out of the bowler's um, waist while he or she is running up to bowl and the batter hits the ball, uh, so nobody saw the towel fall out of the waist of the bowler, um, so the umpires didn't call and signal dead ball and the bowler bowled the ball and the batter hits the ball uh, down the ground, passes the bowler and hits the towel that fell off from the bowler's waist. That will also not be considered illegal fielding. Why? Because the towel fell off the waist of the bowler accidentally. Remember I mentioned the very important word is that a piece of clothing or equipment needs to be willfully discarded and only then if the ball in play hits that piece of clothing that has or equipment that has been willfully discarded will it be considered illegal fielding. So to answer your question, um, in this situation where the towel is still in tucked into the waist of a bowler or a fielder, and the ball in play hits the towel on the waist, it is not illegal fielding. Next question is from Saga. If the bells are already down and the fielder thought throws the ball to the stumps, the runner should be inside the crease, just hit stump, or it should completely fall down or just at the instance when the stump comes out of the ground. So I think uh, Abdullah Saga is asking, when is the wicket down in this scenario? Uh, Tom, I don't understand the, the question. Can you can um, you just visualize me the scenario? Just explain okay. to me. OK, so so the bales are already down. Um, uh, fair, they fell off accidentally by the, the wind or the, the wind blew them off. Yes. OK. And, yeah. and then a throw came in um, and it just removes. Well, it just hits the stumps. Um, yeah. But what needs to happen for the stumps or, or the wicket to be down? Thank you for your question, Saga. For that weekend to be down, if the bells um, accidentally, let's say the wind blew them off, one of three things. Firstly, the, the any of the fielders must take the ball in one hand, the stumps in the other, and simultaneously remove one of the stumps out of the ground. That's the first way of putting that wicket down. <laughs> Sorry if the bells fell off accidentally. The second way of putting that wicket down is if one of the fielders uh, throw the ball goes against the stumps and it removes one of the stumps completely out of the groove. That is the second way of putting down uh, that wicket. And the third way of putting down that wicket is if one of the fielders with the ball in hand hit the, hit the stumps so hard, let's say it's the leg stump hard enough 
to remove that stump out of the groove, out of the ground. So those are the three ways to put that wicket down when the bells, when the bells were accidentally, um, let's say, blown off by the wind. So only those three ways. Um, um, that's how you can put the wicket down. Over, Tom. Thank you, Abdullah. Very clear. Next question is from Satarguna. The striker accidentally drops his bat beyond the popping crease at the striker's end. Actually, I think this is at the non-striker's end when turning for the second run. Then when completing the third run, the striker dives and manages to touch the edge of the bat's handle with his fingertips before the wicket at the bowler's end was fairly put down. So just picture this, Abdullah. Uh, at the turn for the second run, the striker drops his bat. So he made good his ground, but dropped his bat and then turned for the second run and then uh, turned um, also legally for the third run and for completing his third run because he was in danger of being run out he takes a dive and he ends up outside of the crease with the bat handle in his hand and the rest of the bat say the blade is grounded beyond the popping crease out or not out when the ball puts the wicket down So, Drugna, the first answer, out or not out? That is not out. And the reason why is any part of the bat is still the bat. Half of that bat is inside or behind the, the popping crease. As long as the striker is in contact, the striker's hand is in contact with the bat. And uh, I think you said the, the striker's fingertips were, still, were touching the bat, Tom. Did you say that? That's correct. So as long as that fingertips are touching that bat, that would be considered according to the law that the striker has got the bat in, in his or her hand. And i.e. in this case, striker is not out because uh, the bat is behind the, uh, behind the popping crease and the fingertips are still touching the bat. So all that needs to, that fingertips needs to touch it. And in your example, it is touching, not out. Perfect, Tula, and I think um, also explained um, why that uh, batter in your picture was not out, uh, sorry, was out, because he was not holding the bat uh, with his hand or touching the bat with his hand. The bat was um, on his um, thigh, and the back of his thigh and that is not part of the hand so that batter was out run out but this situation because the hand was touching the bat and the bat was grounded behind the popping crease um Satraguna's example is not out next question is from Declan does there have to be an appeal if a batter is out bold or is bold? Abdullah? Uh, Declan, there are some obvious uh, dismissals where you do not have to appeal. Bold is one of them. Everyone knows if the batter is bold, no need to appeal to the umpire and no need for the umpire to, to actually uh, give out the, the, the batter. There will be times where, let's say, the keeper standing up, and the the um, the ball goes against the stumps, and maybe you're not sure whether the keeper's bowled uh, uh, or not, or maybe the 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 keep um, the keeper's pads took off uh, the bells. In that instance, call and signal dead ball. Take the ball. Go and consult uh, your colleague at strikers in. Ask him uh, uh, whether the ball. Um, took off the bells or whether it was the keeper's pads and let's say the, uh, the, your strikers in confirm it's the keeper's pads, it's, it's the ball 
you then in that instance give the striker out bold. But usually in in a normal bowl, a ball a ball goes through bat and pad, takes off the balls or take a stum out of the ground. No need to appeal. Similarly to to uh, ball gets hit in the air. Um, field the catch as the ball five meters inside the boundary or ball goes to second or third or fourth slip. Uh, there's no need um, to give the batter out. Um, although I've seen batters, it's the ball to second slip and still stand. In those instances, you need to give the batter out. But then usually, um, if it goes, to, you know, catches in the outfield, goes to third or fourth slip, no need to give the batter out. So yes, there are modes of dismissals, which are obvious where you do not need, they don't need to be an appeal, nor do you need to give the batter out because it's obviously, it's obvious if they get bold, the batter will put the um, the bat under his arm and, and leave the field. Over, Tom. Thanks, Dula. Next question from Saiga. What if the one umpire gives a decision out and the other umpire wants to refer it? Um, I think you did mention this. If mm -hmm. you can just uh, repeat. Yeah, well, um, thanks for your question, uh, Saga. There are nine modes of dismissals, and three of them falls under the jurisdiction of the strikers in umpire, which is hit wicket, uh, run out at the strikers in and stumped. All the others are uh, falls under the jurisdiction of the of the other uh, umpire. Each umpire can only answer appeals that falls within his or her jurisdiction. If the appeal does not fall in your jurisdiction, you are not allowed to go to the other umpire and say, uh, uh, um, um, let's say Tom was bowling in and I'm striker's in. There's a huge appeal for court behind. Tom said, not out. He did anything. I cannot go and say, Tom, but I heard it here from strikers in. Please give the batter out. That appeal does not fall within your jurisdiction. So you're not allowed to intervene. You're only allowed to consult in cases of where you want to check whether the ball uh, carried clearly, or in my case where you wanted to check whether the batter was bold or did the keeper maybe take off uh, the bells or with his or her pads. Uh, in those instances, you can consult, but usually if it doesn't fall in your jurisdiction, uh, you can not uh, interfere. Over, Tom. Thanks, Dula. Next question is from Justin. When does the wicket keeper who is allowed to bowl, when is he allowed to start bowling? Is he allowed to bowl in the second over? Is he allowed to bowl in the last over? Is there a restriction of when a wicket keeper can bowl? Amtula? Uh, Justin, keeper can bowl at, at any time. If after one over, the captain feels like uh, he or she wants the keeper to bowl the second uh, over for whatever reason. I could, can't think of a reason, but for whatever reason, uh, the captain wants the keeper to bowl the second over of, of the game. And no problem. Keeper takes off his or her pads and gloves. Uh, one of the other nominated players puts it on. The keeper, uh, now uh, bowler, can bowl the second over. Whether it's the last over, if the, key, if the uh, fielding captain wants... Uh, the keeper to bowl the last over of uh, the game. Yeah, no issue. Keeper takes off his or her pads. Uh, one of the other nominated players puts it on and the keeper can then bowl the last over. So point I'm trying to make is at any time, the, the, if the feeling keeper wants uh, the keeper to bowl, uh, the law allows uh, for it. Over, Tom. Thanks, Tula. Next question is from Damasin. If the bowler is in his delivery stride and his hat is blown off his head just before he releases the ball, is this allowed or is this illegal? Dula? The, uh, just to confirm the scenario, Tom, so as the bowler is running in, uh, the, the bowler delivers the ball um, and then the keepers, the wind blows the keeper's hat off, um, off his, um, uh, the blows the, the, the hat off his head. Is that the scenario? No, it's the bowler bowling with a cap on and the bowler's cap gets blown off in his delivery stride. 
Oh, okay. Sorry, I misunderstood the question. I'm glad that I've that I've confirmed it for clarity. So, in those instances, you as the bolus in umpire needs to intervene immediately. What would you do? You need to call and signal dead ball immediately. Why? That can distract the striker. So if you see that happens, call and signal dead ball immediately. It was the 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 cap was uh, fell off accidentally. It was the wind that blew it off, uh, but. Uh, the, the striker can be distracted by the cap blowing off. U.S. bowlers in umpire or either umpire can or you know, should intervene immediately. If I see that happen, I will immediately call and signal uh, dead ball. And then I'll ask the bowler to uh, uh, re-bowl re -bowl the ball. Over, Tom. Thanks, Dula. I think just to add to that, um, normally um, male bowlers do not bowl with a cap on. So if it's a male uh, bowling, I would uh, tell the bowler uh, as he is about to start his run up that he shouldn't be bowling with a cap on. He should give me the cap to keep uh, while he bowls the over. If it is a female bowler, um, females do like to use the caps to keep their hair in place. Um, so you do often see females bowling with the cap on, especially spin bowlers. Um, so you do allow them to bowl it. It is allowed to bowl with a cap on, uh, but just maybe before they start bowling, you should uh, ask them if their cap is uh, on tightly so that it does not fly off during their bowling run up or their delivery stride. Next question is from Sandeep. If a bowler is bowling with sunglasses on and the batter is requesting to remove the sh sunglasses as the reflection of the sun is in the batter's eyes, is it mandatory for a bowler to remove his or her shades, Abdullah? Sandeep, yes. You will ask the bowler to remove uh, his or her shade, and you will inform the bowler why you uh, you asking the bowler to remove the the shades. It's because the reflection of the sunlight is going into the striker's uh, eyes, and it is distracting him. So yes, in that uh, instance, ask the bowler to remove his or her shades. Thanks, Dula. Oh, over Tom. Uh, next uh, comment is from Anil. Um, he has sent payment for the level one exam via PayPal, and he asks that I should let him know when received. Uh, Anil, thank you very much for your payment. I do get over 200 emails a day. Um, for work and for cricket. I unfortunately am unable to respond to all of them. Um, what I will do is the latest that anyone can pay for the level one exam is next week, Friday, the 28th of October at 3 p.m. South African time. Our last lecture is next week, Monday. So between Monday and Friday, um, I will be going through all of the emails with proof of payments. Please send all your proofs of payment to training at wpcua.co.za. You can pay for more than one exam candidate. Just note in your email that when you forward me the proof of payment who you are paying for and what i will do is uh, next week monday night i will post all the email addresses for all the candidates who have been paid for and next week wednesday i will do the same to update the list of candidates whose email addresses have been paid for and the exam link will be sent to. And I will send a final list on Friday night, the 28th of 
October of all the email addresses who exams have been paid for. And I will use that list to send the exam link email on Saturday morning. OK, so uh, please accept my apology that I will not thank and reply to every single proof of payment that I will get. I will merely uh, send a group thanks when I send out the list of confirmed pay years on Monday, Wednesday and Friday nights next week. Next comment is from Sanjay. Um, he is a late joiner and has left his email address for me to send him all the course material. Uh, anybody else who is joining for the first time and has not received any course material, uh, which includes the links to the um, YouTube videos of all the recordings, as well as the link to download the presentation, as well as the PDF of the new laws. Um, please put your email address in the chat box and I will uh, add you to the mailing list so that you get all the course material and links to the last two lectures tomorrow and next week Monday. Uh, Dale asks, can the fielding team place a helmet or helmets in certain areas on the field to distract the batter and lure him to attempting to score five penalty runs by hitting the helmets? Uh, Abdullah, you want to take that one? Uh, yes, Tom. Uh, thanks for your question, Dale. Uh, Dale, the law guides us here when it comes to uh, the fielding team's helmets. They, according to the laws of cricket, there is only one place on the cricket field that you may place the fielding team's helmet or helmets, and that is behind the wicketkeeper. That's the only place. Uh, nowhere else. If uh, if the fielding side wants to place it anywhere else, it's not allowed. The law tells us it can only be placed behind the wicket keeper. Over, Tom. Thanks, Tula. Next question is from Ira. Ira asks, when there is bad weather and the wind changes the direction of the ball, to the bales, is it out or dead ball? So I'm not sure if the ball has been bowled here, Abdullah. Um, yeah, that's what I'm assuming. The ball has been bowled and because of a gust of wind, the ball swings and hits the bales of the striker. Out or dead ball? Yeah, yeah Ira, the ball is in play. Uh, yeah, dust of wind came across. Uh, unfortunately, uh, if it hits the stumps, uh, the batter is out uh, bold. It's unfortunate, but but yeah, a batter out bold. If that is your if that is your scenario, ball being delivered, and as the ball is uh, going through the air towards the the striker, there's this sudden uh, gust of wind, and it now. Uh, uh, because of the wind, it now starts tailing into the uh, to the stumps, uh, and and it goes against the stumps. Yeah, unfortunately, the batter is out bold. If that is your example, over Tom. Yeah, Abdullah. I mean, I think uh, bowlers are often trying to get a conventional swing or reverse swing on the ball, and if it happens with the wind or against the wind, or if there is no wind, uh, then they've done well to achieve their plan of making the ball swing. So definitely legal delivery and out bold. Sandeep just wants clarity on his uh, bowler's shades. Uh, what if those glasses which are making a glare into and distracting the batter's view are prescription glasses. Does the bowler still have to take them off, Abdullah? Uh, Sandeep, the, the, the law 
protects the batter from being distracted in any uh, in any way. So if the shades, and I'm assuming this, these are now sunglasses that you that you are re referring to. If the sunglasses, if there is a reflection from the sunglasses into the eyes of the batter, the batter gets protected uh, by the law. If the batter gets distracted in any way, in this case by this by uh, the sunglasses, you need to ask the bowler to, uh, to remove it. Uh, usually, if the bowler uh, has uh, if wears uh, spectacles, uh, then and if it's uh, the bowler will and I've, and I've seen bowlers have um, prescribed sunglasses, but they also have a normal pair of of glasses. So I'm sure that bowler is the sunglasses is not the only prescribed glasses that he or she is wearing. Uh, you you can ask the bowler then to to, uh, to put on the other the other glasses that's not sunglasses and to bowl in. Uh, Tom, I don't know if you want to add anything here, but as far as I know, uh, as soon as the batter gets distracted, the, the, the law comes in here and um, the law tells us that um, batter gets distracted, we need to intervene. I fully agree with you, Abdullah. Uh, prescription sunglasses, yes, they can be shiny and cause a glare from reflection, which distracts the striker. Uh, but normal prescription spectacles are clear glass and uh, probably not shiny, um, you know, uh, what's it called, frames. Um, so they would not um, cause a glare that would distract the striker. So you're quite right. You would ask the bowler to change from his prescription sunglasses to his prescription spectacles, which shouldn't cause a problem for the better. Um, Follow-up question on that. Thank you for the explanation and clarification, but um, does not that becomes a person of the baller in that case? And once it becomes a person, is that the batsman's right to ask him to remove it? Um, yes, Sandeep, um, I don't know if you remember many years ago, the West Indies, when they were in their prime with uh, fast bowlers such as Kirtley Ambrose and Courtney Walsh, mm -hmm. they played against Australia in a uh, one-day match. And um, Kirtley Ambrose, it was a coloured clothing and a white ball. Kirtley Ambrose was wearing white um yes. sweat sweatbands on his yeah. forearms yeah and uh ian healy felt that he was distracted by mm. those white sweatbands because the ball was also white so he uh kindly asked for kirtley ambrose to remove <laughs> the white sweatbands and uh and kirtley ambrose because of that request had to remove the white sweatbands from his forearms uh, but of course, what followed was a barrage of short pitch deliveries uh, yeah. from a very uh, irate Kirtley Ambrose. Um, yeah. So, yes, they were part of his uh, person because they were worn by Kirtley Ambrose, but because they distracted the striker, um, upon the request by the striker, the umpires had to ask Kirtley Ambrose to remove the sweatbands. And similarly, um, if a striker is distracted by the glare that is made by the reflection of the bowler's sunglasses, then unfortunately the bowler will have to take them off. Um, the fielding side and the bowler will probably be upset with the striker, but yep. um, it is a batsman's game as we often hear, and so they will have to remove the sunglasses. Okay. Um, I did ask this question based on my recent experience where this incident had happened and I requested Baller to change his glasses, but mm -hmm. he was absolutely upset with my request. And of course, uh, uh, you know, the action that I asked him to take and um, batter was in his right to 
to ask him to remove those. But I also remember one incident or or one um, one uh, incident, yeah, when Australian bowler was uh, or has his hairs uh, colored with the shiny blue color. I'm trying to find out that video though, mm. um, and which has also been getting distracted uh, to the batsman. In this case, now can we ask them, ask the bowler to wear a cap to? To not to get distracted for the batsman. Good question. I have seen that uh, that video. Video. Mm. Um, I, I'm not sure actually what the umpires if they did intervene if the striker did uh, mention that he was distracted. Uh, but yes, I think the only um, way to hide that distraction would be <laughs> to to wear a cap. Um, and again, uh, the cap would have to be tight so that it does not fly off wow. in the bowler's run-up or bowling action. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Great stuff. Uh, I see it's also answered uh, Dale's question, um, who was asking if a, a male had long hair and wanted to wear a cap or a headband uh, to keep the hair in place. Uh, yes, we do allow uh, males to uh, bowl with a cap if they so wish. Uh, but again, please make sure that it is um, tight around the the head so that it doesn't blow off. A, um, a veteran spinner for the club in Cape Town called Pinelands Cricket Club, um, played for many years. And because he was bowled for most of his career, uh, he bowled with a cap on. Why? Because he was a spinner. And in two day cricket that we used to play, we had unlimited overs for the amount, the number of overs that a bowler could bowl. So um, he would worry about his head getting sunburnt, even with sun block on his head, uh, if he were to bowl 30 overs without a cap on. So that is why we were quite happy for him to bowl with his cap on. And he made sure that it was always tight enough not to be blown away by the Cape Town wind. Okay, so I hope that clears up what is allowed by bowlers and um, just as long as it doesn't distract the striker, it is perfectly fine. Um, so there's a link that has been put in here. I think it is to the um, scenario in question about the blue hair. Uh, so thank you, Sandeep, for posting that. Uh, those who are interested can um, can click on it and watch it. I did see a hand was up about 10 minutes ago. I cannot remember who it was. That hand is now down. There are no further questions. Uh, was it you, Sandeep? Yeah, it was me. Okay. And I, I believe I think there was an... Uh, a follow-up question on one of the questions answered, but I don't remember now. If I do, I would post it in chat. Thank you. Okay, perfect, Sandeep. Hopefully it was maybe answered in uh, one of our other scenarios. Uh, if there are any other questions, this would be your opportunity to uh, raise your hand and we can uh, go through them uh, one by one. Um, if not, I'd like to thank you all for your attendance and participation. Uh, we shall be meeting up okay. again tomorrow, same time, same place. I will be sending a new meeting link. Remember that there is a new link for every meeting. Uh, some people are having problems uh, connecting to our links. Uh, please try another device or uh, delete Teams on your device and re-add the application. Uh, somebody did that earlier this evening and was able to join after reinstalling Microsoft Teams on their phone. Sandeep, you've got your hand up. The floor is yours. Yeah, I, I, 
I remember why I, I did uh, put my hands up earlier, and this was in an answer to the question what Sagar has asked related to the bat. The batter has actually left the bat while running the second, or he he drops the bat, which is the blade inside the crease, but the but the handle is 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 out, and while completing the third run, he dives and just just touch to the handle um, of the bat. Would it be considered as out of his ground or not? And I believe the answer was given as not out. Um, so the counter question to that or follow up question to that was. Um, the scenario in this case, what Sagar has narrated was related to the the scenario where he has dropped the bat while running the first run, and then while completing the third run, he dived and touched the bat, which was already there um, at the end of the first run. In so, is this still answer? Is that he is not out on his on his third run completion? Yes, I think that's exactly the scenario that Saigar described. Is there a difference? Mm. No, it's the same scenario, but I just want to double double check on the answer. Uh, is it is it that still be called as not out? Correct. As long as the hand is in contact with the bat, uh, then the, the the batter will be considered as inside the ground because uh, the bat, if in contact with the hand, is considered to be part of the batter. So in that case, he's not actually making the whole ground until the popping crease, but he he's running a maybe a, a meter or a meter and a half short and just touched to the handle, which was all the bat, which was already been left there at the at the completion of the first run. Yes, Sandeep, I mean, you will see when uh, batters are running, uh, they never go into and turning. They never go into the crease mm, themselves. Mm, they just mm, put, put the bat over the popping mm, crease. This mm, is this is very much a similar situation, similar scenario. just that the, okay. the bat is on the ground. But okay. as long as thank you, it, as long as the hand is in contact with the bat, then the Bat belongs to the better. Okay, so so this is Karthik to to make it more interesting. This was already discussed. Uh, say like uh, we have seen. I mean players um, grip though it is on the handle. Some part of the grip may get protruded. I mean they don't have the habit of. Uh, I mean they have the habit of ticks. For example, Sauro Ganguly. He has the habit of protruding the glove. I mean, some region from the handle. So even though uh, the grip is on the handle, if he touches that grip with the glove worn on the hand on the bat, which was dropped for the earlier run, so is that considered as a bat being grounded behind the popping crease? Uh, yes, the grip is part of the bat. So, um, if no, but it is touching only the protruded region, which is not uh, on the handle. Um, Kartik, the grip yeah. is part of the bat. Protruded or on the bat, it's part of the bat. Okay. Okay. Okay, Tom. Okay, Abdullah. Thank you. You're welcome, uh, Kartik. And, um, once again, thank you for all of you joining us this evening and your interaction. That's how we all learn. We shall meet up tomorrow again at uh, 1830 South African time. I will send the link for tomorrow's meeting later tonight. I hope you've all enjoyed and learned. Thank you and good night. Thank you, Tom Abdullah. Good night. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Good night, everyone. Bye. Good night. Bye. See you tomorrow. Bye. Bye. Night.